Good morning. Today's scripture is John 17, 1 through 5, and verse 24. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory and the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Children are dismissed if you'd like to head out to Children's Church. And while they are headed out, I have a question for those of you who are here. Uh, and remember, when I ask you questions, they're not rhetorical, right? When, when you hear the phrase eternal life, what I, words, ideas, images, what comes to mind when you hear eternal life? Heaven, living forever, paradise, what else? Never dying, seeing Jesus, I like it. Anything else? Security, wholeness, eternal joy. Okay, here's my next question for you. When does eternal life begin? Ooh, when you accept Jesus, okay. I'm sorry? I second that. What was over here? I hear words, but I'm deaf. Oh, she's just mouthing it now, so I really, but she says when she dies. There you go. Okay. I, I'm going to say yes to all of the above. Uh, for me, John 17, verse 3, that Doug just read for us, uh, is a game-changing scripture, um, at least in my world. We might finish today, and you're like, well, not in mine, but it is for me, so we're going to try here. Um, I always hesitate when I hear people say, Pastor, I grew up in church and I never heard fill in the blank thing. Um, I, I hesitate to like actually believe when people say that because part of me wants to go, well, one, your preacher probably said it and you just didn't listen. Or uh, maybe they didn't and because uh, if they didn't, then either they're a heretic or I am. So I get a little, little nervous about that one. But I grew up in a church where my understanding it probably is not, honestly, not what was said, but my understanding of eternal life was this thing that happened after I die, right? I, I walked an aisle at five years of age, because you walked aisles in my church, and I prayed a prayer uh, with uh, Pastor Raymond down up front. I have no idea what I prayed, but I know that I prayed it. I prayed it in Jesus' name, and he said, and now you're saved, and when you die, you'll go to heaven, right? Which was great, because my mother made me pray that horrible prayer when I was a kid. Y'all have to pray this thing? Now I lay me down to sleep, right? Pray the, what do you pray? Uh, if I should die before I wake. <laughs> Don't do that to kids, it's horrible. <laughs> Every night it was like, I can't sleep. Anyhow, I was pretty convinced that eternal life was what happened when God came and apparently stole my soul in the middle of the night and I died. And my picture of eternal life was really based off of, I had a, a pastor, his name was Pastor Rick. He was awesome, he was amazing. But whenever he was short and round, and whenever he talked about heaven, he said, there will be meatloaf. <laughs> and, and no cardiologists, right? So like, that's it. That was my picture of eternal life. I die, I go, apparently I can eat a lot, no calories. And Jesus would be there. But... John 17, 3 is a far better picture of eternal life. But it's one that blows my little categories. Because I don't know if you, if you caught it when Doug read it, but John 17, 3, this is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus praying. He's in the middle of his, of his prayer. He's talking to the Father. And he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's eternal life. 
And I look at this definition and, and, and where Jesus has it situated and as I, uh, how he has put it here in the middle of this prayer. And it sure sounds to me like Jesus is saying that eternal life is less about everlasting living and more about knowing the everlasting God. And if that's true, then as uh, Steve said and Colleen seconded, eternal life is maybe, for, for us, right, before I lay me down to sleep and God takes my soul away, before then, eternal life is more about now than then. Because eternal life is something that I get to enter into the second I place my faith in Jesus Christ. Like now, we get to live it. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when Jesus defines eternal life as knowing the Father and the Son, knowing who they are, right, knowing these truths about him, that he he situates that definition of eternal life right in the middle of his his prayer, this insanely rare prayer. Like, I'm not sure we catch what we are being gifted here. Where else in Scripture do you read Jesus and you get to actually hear his prayer to the Father? Right? The, the Lord's Prayer, he's just saying, hey, when y'all pray, pray like this. Uh, the prayer outside of Lazarus' tomb, he flat out says, I am saying this so they will hear it. It's here that you get this glimpse of Jesus and the Father, their heart for each other. And all the way around, verse 3, Jesus just says, Father, this is what our relationship has always been like. This is what they need to know so they can have eternal life. They can live it right in this moment. And when we look at what it is that Jesus says when he talks about eternal life, he's very kind. He makes it really easy to pick up on how he is describing his relationship with the Father. Right in in the course of six verses, seven times, he talks about this idea of glorifying. And when he talks about it and he describes it, he says things like, uh, Father, you and I have glorified one another from eternity past. Right? He says, I, the glory that I had with you, Father, before the world even began. Right? This idea that uh, before there was a creation, before there was a world, before there was Adam and Eve, the Father and the Son were already glorifying each other. There was this mutual something happening between them. And, and then he says, and it will happen in eternity future. Right? He says, one day I, I want my people to be part of, I want them to see and enter into this mutual glorification that we have. And he even says right there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's happening now. Right? His definition, the way he, he describes the relationship that he and the Father have, and if you look in John 16, John 14, John 1, he would say, and the Holy Spirit, is one where they glorify one another. Well, that's great, but what in tarnation does it mean? To glorify, when we talk about it in the biblical usage, is a really powerful, loaded word. Right, and these are all of the, don't think of them as separate definitions, this is just synonyms for how you could describe it. To glorify someone else it is to, uh, to clothe the other person with splendor. It's to think about the other person, serve the other person, love the other person in such a way that like everything you do is about making them more splendid. It, it's to adorn them with luster, to honor, to celebrate, to exalt them and exalt in them. It's to delight in them. You want to put it real simple, it's to love them. But to love in a way that looks like this. To love in a way that isn't about, what can I get out of you? But to love in a way that says, how can I make you even more beautiful? When we listen to Jesus pray here in John 17, he says, Father, you and I, John 16, John 14, he says, and the Holy Spirit, for all of eternity, We have had this mutual relationship where I love you to make you more beautiful and you love me to make me more beautiful and we have been celebrating and honoring each other from eternity past. We'll do it to eternity present and we're about to do it on the cross. And he says this is what eternal life is. You and I starting somehow to get a grasp on this idea 
that we serve a God who has eternally, mutually been pouring love into himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this is a concept that I don't have, uh, I, I don't have a pattern for. The ancient Greek fathers, don't worry, we're not about to go down that road too deep, but the ancient Greek fathers, which really just means ancient, right, long time ago, uh, church fathers, so theologians who lived in, guess where? Greece, good job, right? Long time ago, as they were studying this passage and passages like it, I mean, it shows up in Genesis 1 for crying out loud, so they were looking at the whole Bible and they're going, this is how God describes this, his relationship with himself, Father, Son, Spirit, the self-giving, mutual, pouring into each other for all of eternity. And they looked at Scripture, and they looked at this description, and then they looked at the world around them, and they said, we don't have a category for it. For instance, they said they could look at mythology. I mean, they were in Greece, so they're pretty familiar with Greek and Roman mythology. And they said, we look at the gods and all of the stories about the gods in Greek and Roman mythology, none of them are about gods who are just pouring love. They're about gods who are angry and vying for control. They're about gods who are like the seven deadly sins, but on steroids. So we can't look there. And then they looked at humanity, and they said, well, we try, but our love honestly isn't a self-giving, self-pouring, always just emptying for someone else. Our love is about, I love you, but what do I get? So they said, we got a new category. God's blowing all of them. And they came up with a word for it. This will be on Jeopardy. The word is perichoresis. They literally had to make up a word to describe the love that God has for God. Uh, Perry, you know this word, right? It shows up in perimeter, right? The outside. Uh, Echoresis just means this idea of like to circle. So it, it literally means to circle around, to flow around. And they came up with this idea, they said, that's what the Trinity is. And that's where you get images like this, right? Like the Son is always circling around the Father, celebrating Him, honoring Him. And at the same time, the Son is circling around the Spirit, honoring and celebrating Him. But while the Son's doing that, well, the Father's circling around the Spirit and exulting in Him, and the Father's circling around the Son and the Spirit to the Father and to the Son. There is this eternal love. And as they began to look at this and this idea of perichoresis, they said, you know, it's not stagnant. They're Greek. What do you think of when you think of a Greek wedding? Getting fat. Getting fat. There you go. You, you smash plates, you yell, opa, and you dance. A circle dance, as a matter of fact, most of the time. And so they weren't trying to be irreverent, right? They weren't trying to say, yes, God is forever up there like doing a line dance or something. But they said, this is a picture. This is what God is doing. The Father circling around the Son and the Spirit, and the Son circling around the Father and the Spirit, and the Spirit circling around the Father and the Son. Loving, pouring into each other this beautiful, mutual dance of love for eternity. When you come back to John 17... Verse 3, Jesus says, this is eternal life. That you know this. You know the Father, and you know me. And you know this beautiful, mutual, indwelling dance that we have always been part of. Now that's pretty cool. But you should be asking a really significant question right now. Right? I was uh, kidding with Judy earlier about our assigned seats. Like we have assigned seats in here. We've got assigned seats in the Sunday school classroom at this point. Um, when I was in seminary, I attended a church and worked at a church in Ipswich, Massachusetts, itty bitty little American Baptist church. Like this section of our sanctuary was the sanctuary at this itty bitty church. And even though we were so tiny, we had assigned seats because it's just what you do. So my assigned seat was behind a man named uh, Gene Case. Uh, Gene is a, a brilliant, amazing man, really loves the Lord, uh, had been a school principal, school superintendent by the time I knew him, retired, and was consulting because his wife regularly said, I need you to be somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, 
Okay, so Gene, would, he sat in front of me because assigned seats, and the dude apparently didn't believe in paper, so he would just bring his bulletin, and he scribbled notes every way, upside down, around everything. No one could read this thing. But I could always read one phrase, because somewhere in the middle of the sermon, Gene, in really big black letters, would write, so what? And then he would scribble underneath it. Because that was like the most important thing. So it's kind of drilled into my brain. So what? I think there's phenomenal so what to beginning for you and I to understand, to do exactly what Jesus said. You want eternal life today? Then you got to understand the relationship the Father and I and the Spirit and I and the Father and the Spirit have had forever. So let me walk us through a couple so what's, and they're going to build on each other. So here's the very first so what. God really is love. We kind of throw this term around. Certainly it's used in Scripture. John, in 1 John, right, we'll talk about how God is love. But if, if the Greek fathers are right and perichoresis describes the Father and we agree with Jesus here, then friend, he really is love at his core. Read mythology. Read the Greeks and the Romans and all of their fun stuff. Their gods at their core are anger, are power. They are chaos. They're love, but they mean it in a way that is all about how, what can I get out of you? Even their gods of love and their goddesses of love, it's erotic. I I want to use you. When you look at God, Father, Son, and Spirit, He really is, at his core, love. The self-giving, other-oriented, pouring out, sacrificial, glorifying love. How can I make the other more beautiful, more splendid? How do I celebrate you even more? And listen, we could spend hours unpacking this, but let me just put it this way, because someone here today needs to hear this part. If God, at his core, is love, if the creator of the heavens and the earth, and you at his core is love, then literally any other definition of success you're aiming for is out of step with him. His definition of success is not success. It is not um, power. It isn't money. It, it, It isn't anything other than love. His definition, though, of what love looks like. There's nothing else. That's why there's two great commandments, and they're pretty straightforward. Love God. Glorify him. Make him look beautiful. And then love your neighbor as you love yourself. Look at your neighbor and glorify them. Celebrate them. Help them to become whom they are in Jesus Christ. That's who your God is. And when you stand before him in glory, that's what gets the well done. That's the first so what. Here's the second. Ready for this one? He doesn't need us. No, really, he doesn't. If Jesus is telling the truth here, and I happen to believe he's God and therefore telling the truth, if before the creation of the world, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were already mutually loving each other, circling around each other, dancing that dance of love, then he doesn't need us. God did not look at the nothing and say, I'm going to create the world because I want somebody to love. He's already got it perfectly. Nor did he create you and I because he wanted someone to love him half-heartedly, not well, and generally speaking, more treasonous than actual love. He already has someone to love him perfectly, immeasurably infinitely. He does not need us. He doesn't need your love. And some of us need to hear that, because we're going to talk in a few minutes, right? We've already said we are commanded to love. We are. But not because my love adds anything to the one who is love. He's love. He doesn't need us. But he does want us. Isn't that mind-blowing? 
How about the fact that the God who has for all of eternity been in this dance of love, the Son with the Father and the Spirit, is actually on this earth, in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what's coming, praying that he would be glorified in that moment. But you need proof that God wants you, you just have to look at that. That Jesus came and took on flesh right here in this world. And then he prays in verse 24 of chapter 17, Father, I want those who you have given me to be with me where I am. I want them to see my glory. The glory you've given me because you love me before the creation of the world. God doesn't need you and me at all. We add nothing to his love. But he wants us. And the way Jesus puts it is he doesn't just want us, he wants us with him. He wants us in that dance. I want them to be with me and to see my glory. I want them to be part of my love. Well, that takes you to your fourth so what. God actually calls us to dance, to join in this dance, now. If eternal life is a now thing, then you and I are called here, now, in this moment, to join in the dance. To join in this love that the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Spirit, and we are somehow allowed to be part of. That's his design, that you and I be part of this. But there's a problem, right? You can't, and neither can I. So we were created, we were made to be in lockstep with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We were made to make much of them and then to celebrate each other, to constantly be pouring out into others our love because he's constantly pouring into us his love. But since Adam and Eve, we have not been able to dance that dance. Actually, we dance a dance that looks a little bit more like instead of us weaving around other people and orbiting them, We stand in the center of our little universe and say, y'all may circle around me. Even the most altruistic of us do this. right? I look at my friends and I look at my family and I say, you can circle around me. You can love me. You can honor and celebrate me. And I'll even honor you and love you as long as I get something out of it. As long as there's some quid pro quo here, a little reciprocity. Even the kindest, sweetest, most generous, self-giving person you've ever met does that. Because some part of their identity is tied up in, I'm the kindest, sweetest, most generous person you've ever met. You get something out of it. All of us. We don't know how to dance this dance. But we have a, a choreography of conflict, and we know how to dance the dance of duty. Right, The dance that says, I love you because I get something out of it. I'll forgive you for this little thing because I'm going to need you to forgive me for a bigger thing. I I will serve you because I need you to serve me in some other way. Or some of us flat out dance a dance that makes us say, I will do these things, Lord. I will begrudgingly love people. I guess I'll care for the least of these. I'll love them because then you'll give me eternal life. Like it's a duty to love. Like somehow you can earn to be brought into the kingdom of God. But please don't misunderstand, that's not what Jesus said. He did not say, this is how you earn eternal life. He just said, this is it. This is eternal life. God's love, he doesn't need us, he does want us. We're expected to join in the dance, and we can't. And so here's the last, so what? God showed us how. You know, that's why we spent the past year just looking at Jesus' life. Right, we come and we look at Jesus from every angle of this multifaceted, beautiful diamond because the more you and I look at Jesus, the more we see the beautiful dance that is our God. The more you look at Jesus, the more you see how he lives out what you and I can't do on our own. You look at Jesus and you actually watch God loving God. You look at Jesus and you see the way he honored his Father and he honors the Spirit and is honored by them. And because he is perfectly, completely loved, he can be loved. Every interaction you watch Jesus have with another person, friends, he's glorifying them 
circling around them, making them more splendid, more beautiful, celebrating them, honoring them, making them who they were meant to be in the Lord. That's what Jesus does. Think about it. Think John 8, woman caught in adultery. We've talked about this before. I don't think that actually should be written in your Bible. I don't think John wrote it, but I do think it is a true story. I think Jesus did it. But in that, you remember a woman gets caught in adultery and all of the towns, they show up, they make a big circle around her not to celebrate her. Or they got stones in hand, they're ready to kill her. And Jesus comes. And he, well, he dances around her, guys. First thing Jesus does is he gives her justice. The people in the town were there to bring some kind of justice. Last I checked, it takes two people to, to engage in adultery, and they only had one. And so Jesus says to them, you go ahead and pick up the stone if none of you are sinning. And they all put the stone down and they walk away. But that in and of itself, honestly, is not giving the woman justice. Justice is when the one who could have thrown a stone chose instead to let the stone seal his tomb and take her place. Jesus walks around this woman who's been stripped of dignity. She's nothing more than adulteress. And, you know, he doesn't call her that. This is a woman. He gives her humanity and identity and, and, and gives her what is being stripped away by her sin. And then he looks at this woman and he says to her, you don't have to stay in your sin. You can go. You don't have to live this part of your life forever. <laughs> You're free. But he doesn't just send her to say, oh yeah, you can go, yay, you know, we're all tolerant around here. He says, go and sin no more. He says, what you did is not God's blessed. It's, it's marred God's best. But you can go made new. You can live a different life. The more that you and I look at the beauty that is Jesus, the beauty that is the way he loves us, the more we put ourselves in the center of that circle and we say, I'm the one who deserves to have the stones thrown. I'm the one who shouldn't be forgiven. I'm the one who should be trapped in my shame. I'm the one who should be stuck forever in that part of my story. And we see Jesus circle around us. We watch Jesus just shower us with his love. The more we see the beauty that is Jesus Christ, the more we learn the dance. And we're going to talk next week when we look at the rest of the prayer. In this first part, Jesus is just he's talking to the Father about their relationship, about wanting us to be part of it. We'll see as we look at the prayer next week. And Jesus is going to talk more how you learn the dance. For now, you and I just need to know that this dance is one that Jesus does, not out of duty. His dance is one of sheer love for the Father and for us. And the more we sit in that love, the more we find beauty. And something funny happens. We stop standing in the center of our own little universe, forcing people to orbit us, loving them out of duty. And we start falteringly joining into the dance learning how to forgive other people, not because I have to, but because I'm forgiven. Learning how to circle around other people and sacrifice for them because Jesus sacrificed everything for me. Learning how to circle around folks and say, I'm going to love the least of these. I'm going to give of my time and money and everything to give them dignity because I am the least of these. And Jesus gave everything for me. But the more we look at his beauty, the more we get to enter into the dance. I won't learn those steps until glory. That's when I'll know them perfectly. Until then, I enter into eternal life now. Because I know my Father, I know the Son, I know the Spirit, and I see their dance around me. That means I can dance around you. So we're going to finish with the same three questions we always do as the band's coming up. I hope as you're looking, you see who Jesus is the one who has been in mutual, eternal dance of love. The one who came to this earth to show you his love. You're the one who he has come and given everything for. 
you're the one he wants to join in his dance. And so the question becomes, and this is between you and the Lord, so what's he asking you to do? And what's it look like to love like him? Who's he asking you to be as you become the one who allows him to love you? Let's come before him in prayer. Jesus, I pray, I pray for myself, I pray for every person who is here, that more and more we would, we would know eternal life, we would know you and the Father, and that we would know you not, um, not by just having a bunch of facts memorized or learning how to say perichoresis, but that, Lord, we would know, we would know you intimately. We would come to know you know what it means that we serve a God who is love. The Lord, you give us eyes to see and ears to hear the absolute beauty of the one who is love, who poured that love out for us, and who still does. That you would captivate our hearts and our minds, that we would know even more how, how desperately we need your love and how freely it is given. And Lord, as, as we see you and know you. Teach us how to dance. Invite us, Lord, as those who are loved to love. Thanks for loving us, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. And to all God's people said,